Good morning, Grace Point Church. Welcome. We are so glad you're here with us. Let's stand and join in worship together. Again, in just a bit, I want to welcome you. Uh, 
thinking of the two lines in that song. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom looks like. In the last couple of months, we've actually, or the last number of weeks, as we've asked our question of the morning, which has been our new practice, we've been journeying the uh, Ten Commandments. These, this is part of our grand story, and the people of God who were living in bondage, which we feel and understand sometimes, living in bondage, set free, but what was it going to look like? What was it going to feel like? What could freedom be like in that? And so he gives them a way to see that and to be in community with one another, and that works perfectly with uh, our question for the morning coming right out of the last number of weeks. Here's our question, and I invite you to respond with me after the question. Can anyone, referring to the Ten Commandments, can anyone keep the law of God perfectly? Read with me. Since the fall, no mere human has been able to keep the law of God perfectly but consistently breaks it in thought, word, and deed. God created us to love, enjoy, glorify, and obey him, and in so doing, to flourish as human beings. Why then do we struggle so much to do that? Like an incredibly sophisticated piece of machinery that's broken, we don't operate the way we were designed to because of the fall. The fall is when Adam chose to rebel against God. How does that affect us today? Well, as a result of the fall, we're not just spiritually impaired, but incapacitated. We're not just weak. We have no innate power to obey God's law and glorify him on our own. This is very discouraging to think about, but it's not the end of the story. It's just the beginning. It's the bad news that stands as the backdrop for the spectacularly good news of the gospel, which brings life and hope. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom looks like. Though we're unable to keep the law of God perfectly, there is one, Jesus, who kept the law perfectly for us, which in turn enables us to stand in perfection before the Father. Would you read with me Romans 3, 10 through 12? None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Would you pray with me and then we'll receive our morning offering Holy God, left to our own devices, we transgress your law at every turn. It's not fun to read Paul's words about not even one being able to follow you perfectly. We have no defense, but must plead guilty before your throne of judgment. Your law condemns us and cuts through our pretensions to righteousness convincing us that we desperately need a Savior. And that is the great gift. Your provision for us, your great gift of forgiveness to us by the power of the resurrection and the Holy Spirit in us. We give you thanks for that, Lord, in the name of Jesus.
you stand and sing with us.
that never fails us. You heard your children. thank you that we can trust in your faithfulness, God. As we, word, as we read in your word in Psalm 119, Lord, you are faithful through generations. We praise you, God, that we can trust you, Father, that you love us, that you chose to come die for us, that we might know you, that we get to worship you freely. Father, thank you for this time. Please be working in our hearts as we continue to worship in word, in the scripture, God. Be moving in us. Show us more of you. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen.
Well, I just want to again extend a, a welcome to each of you as you maybe made your way in this morning to worship. We are so glad that you're with us here at Grace Point. My name is Jared Carlson. I'm the senior pastor here. I want to take a quick moment to dismiss what we call point seekers. This is an opportunity today for a pre-K through fifth grade for some continued fellowship and learning. If they'd like to go, there'll be some help outside those doors to take them to another space in our church. Um, also want to just draw your attention to the screen as we have a few events as we continue on through the month of April, just to make you be aware of. We always want to draw your attention, especially to our email that goes out every tw- uh, at noon on every Sunday uh, called Connection Point, where it gives you all these details and then some. But you'll notice going into next week, the 21st is next Sunday, we have a men's floor hockey that night, which is awesome. We had like 30 guys last time of all ages. It was so much fun. I encourage you to Give that some consideration, guys. And uh, the week after, on Tuesday the 23rd, we have a Young at Hearts lunch, uh, which is a special quarterly uh, event that happens for our folks that are about 60 and over, a special time of fellowship. And then, of course, on the 28th, we have uh, our annual meeting, which will be lunch provided after this service in two weeks, just to make you aware of that. Uh, As we prepare to enter into worship this morning, I want to take a quick moment and just prepare our hearts to pray. Uh, We uh, obviously were probably a bit uh, unnerved, if nothing more, very interested to see what was unfolding yesterday as we kind of kept our eyes to the news uh, that was swirling around the Middle East with the the, uh, event of Iran for the first time doing doing an assault against Israel, uh, certainly not veiled behind other parties. And that certainly kind of raises uh, our interest level, our concern, maybe a bit of anxiety. Um, and, you know, it's something that if you take some time and you look at the Bible, we realize that when we think about matters that will unfold in this world, it all swirls around the Middle East and it all swirls around Israel. It doesn't swirl around America, friends. Uh, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that America is not mentioned in the Bible, just so we're aware. And in large part, that's why when we see what happens like yesterday, it definitely uh, invites in us a spirit of uncertainty and concern, and and we begin to wonder a lot of things, and it's understandable. We need to be attentive. We need to be diligent. Uh, We need to be prepared to understand what the Bible says is going to unfold. Uh, In some ways, these things shouldn't be a surprise to us. Um, But I do want to share this with you. In 1 John chapter 5, it says this. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And he goes on to write that whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And so friends, as as we sit sometimes in a space of anticipation and concern and maybe even a feeling of anxiousness, wondering what what does this mean? What's this going to look like? It's one thing to think in terms of things that are apocalyptic and we wonder if this is the, the end of times that the Bible points to or if nothing more, it's this possible entry into a a third world war. Uh, Neither of them invoke a sense of confidence and calm. But we have to understand, friends, that our faith is placed in the one who is a sovereign and rules over all things. That we have faith in the one who has overcome the world. Jesus said to his disciples in the night before he was handed over and delivered to death, he said in, in a calm and loving and firm manner, do not lose heart. Do not be troubled. For I have overcome the world. And what we have in Jesus is the precious gift. What we believe in this place of faith is that God is all-powerful, friends, that he upholds all things by the word of his power, Hebrews 1.3 says. We have confidence and belief in the one who is causing leaders and nations to rise and fall. He knows every star by name. He knows all the hairs on your head. He knows every thought that exists in you before it's formed into words. We know one who, he holds the keys of death itself. We have a, we have a God who makes his enemies a footstool for his feet. So he who overcomes the world, he who has victory is the one who believes that Jesus is God. So friends, let this be your confidence today. Let me Lead us in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. Um, We are grateful for the tremendous gift of grace that is ours to know through faith that Jesus Christ is God, that we are totally and utterly dependent on him for life and hope and salvation, that we do not put our confidence, we do not put our security in the rulers of this time, 
and the leaders and the nations of this time, but in the one who's going to come and reign for all time in a place of righteousness. And so we look to you, Jesus, and we see that you are seated on the throne of God and that you are preparing a time for us. You, you've gone to, to make a home for us and you are going to come back. The scriptures are abundantly clear. You're going to come back and you're going to receive us to yourself. Those who in faith believe that you are God and that you were raised from the dead and that you died on the cross for our sins. This is the gift of life. So Jesus, I pray that you would just lead our hearts into that confidence, that eternal rest that is ours in you today. And uh, Jesus, we just continue to pray for uh, the nation of Israel. We continue to pray for the unfolding events that are around our world. Um, th these are intense and important times. We don't want to be lazy or neglecting of those things. We want to live in a place of anticipation and readiness. But we look to you and trust you that, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all of God's people said, amen. Friends, let me invite you to grab your Bibles. We're going to continue on in our study this morning in Romans, uh, beginning chapter 4 this morning. Now, if you don't have a Bible or you're new to us this morning, there's Bibles in the chairs below you. I want to invite you to grab that and turn with me to Romans 4 as we look at verses 1 through 8. As you're turning there, you know, when I hit my 30th birthday, that was a few years ago now, just so you're aware, but when I hit my 30th birthday, what I also hit was really like my first crisis of aging. I think we've all maybe had our different moments where we hit an age and there's a sense of awareness that comes over us. And part of, the, part of what happens in that moment is we want to do something about it, almost like a place of either denial or this idea of I'm, I'm not what my age says. <laughs> and so for me at my 30th, uh, what I wanted to do was, was I wanted to get into the best shape of my life. And so what I did, and it, believe, this is, believe it or not, I mean, my wife can testify to this, for my 30th birthday present, I decided to order what at the time was this huge workout fad. It was like on every infomercial at night, P90X. Any of you remember that? Okay, this is like 15 years ago. Um, and so I bought this for my 30th birthday, and I was disciplined. And for 90 days, my diet, which was a huge part of it, but then my workouts daily for 45 minutes to an hour daily. And while I definitely lost weight and added muscle, I can tell you the results were far from perfect. But, but here's what was even more humbling. Are you ready for this? The results went away twice as fast. <laughs> Anybody experienced that before? I mean, all of us can relate to this idea of effort and discipline, this idea of, of works to reach a goal. How I many of you are still you know, going hard on your New Year's resolutions? All right, you get my point. The process in this is often long, it's hard. Rarely do we achieve what we're reaching for, but then even if we do, we often find that it's harder to keep, amen, than it is to actually reach. And then here's the sad thing, if you let up even just a little bit, it's like a slippery slope and you just find yourself all the way at the very beginning. How many of you, here's another way to think of it, how many of you ever thought to yourself, I've done all this work and it feels like I have nothing to show for it? Anybody been there before? I know I have, right? Maybe it's the work that you've done on your house or your yard and you feel like you've been out there all day and you look around and you wonder, did I even pick up a stick? I mean, what, what's going on here? Maybe it's a school project or a work project that you're, you're, you're spending time on. I, you know, for, for my, my daughters, you know, we'll, we'll put them up and start to organize and clean their rooms once in a while. And God bless them. They're, they're working away the best they can. And then I'll come up a, a little time later to kind of check on how things are. And my daughters with like this exasperated look on their face will be like, I really have been working this whole time. But they themselves were like, I know it doesn't look like I've done anything, but I have. And here's my point. Here's my point. If our work, if our work to achieve a goal is often frustrating or incomplete and certainly doesn't last, what makes us think that our works or efforts can achieve a different result with God? I mean, why do we believe that our works, and within the church and in religious circles, we, we think of works in the terms of good deeds, okay? Why do we think that our good deeds can earn God's favor or approval or love? I mean, when we think about it, my, my work, the, the things that I'm putting effort into, 
they can't even affect lasting change when it comes to my body or my health or, or, or my home. How am I supposed to believe this idea that my work can affect a right and lasting change with God? I can't even keep my bedroom clean. You know what this sounds like? It sounds like the greatest deception to ever plague the minds of men. John MacArthur, in his commentary in, in, for Romans, wrote in relationship to chapter 4, what we're going to be studying today. He says this, If there is any doctrine that the chief enemy of man and of God desires to undercut and distort, it is the doctrine of salvation. If Satan can cause confusion and error in regard to that doctrine, he has succeeded in keeping men in their sin and under divine judgment and condemnation. This is salvation by works. This is the idea that somehow you can work to then earn God's approval and love for your life. And it's a lie that has infected every religion in the world because it undercuts and it distorts the doctrine of salvation. And it's a lie of great effect because it plays to the pride of our hearts. Right? It's like, it's like Satan who played to the heart of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Ah, eat of the fruit. You, you can become God yourself. Look what you can do. Do you really need him? Because we want to think more of ourselves than we deserve. But the gospel truth is that our nature is deeply flawed. It is absolutely condemned. As Paul says in Romans 3.23, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We are morally bankrupt. We produce works that are like filthy rags in the eyes of a God who is holy. So as we open up our Bibles to Romans 4 this morning, we're going to look at the very important intersection between works and faith. Last week, we ended chapter 3 considering the implications of this gospel truth that we are justified by God, meaning we are counted as worthy, we are accepted and approved by God through a faith that is placed into the finished work and the obedience of Jesus Christ. And this gospel hope is what Paul describes in chapter 1, verse 16, as the very power of God for salvation to those who believe. In other words, faith is a necessary and essential part of receiving this great salvation. And so what we're going to discover this morning is the evidence of this gospel truth, this, this saving faith. And we're going to see it displayed in the lives of two great biblical uh, examples of Abraham and David. And what we're going to see with their lives is that they testify to the idea that our works do not accomplish our salvation, but it's by our works, by our obedience, that we affirm our salvation. And so our sermon today is titled, The Evidence of Faith. If you look with me at Romans 4, I'm going to share with you, I have two points for this morning. The first point simply is this, Abraham believed. If you're taking notes this morning, I want to read verses 1 through 3 for us. So why don't you follow along with me as I read this. Paul writes, well, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, what shall we say according to the flesh? What has he found? Verse 2, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Paul here is making a strong case that our salvation is in Christ alone, through faith alone, by grace alone, for the glory of God alone. Now these statements are important pillars that were a part of the Pro Protestant Reformation. These expressions of alone come from the Latin word sola, which means single or only. And it was a big part of the Protestant Reformation, which was affirming the biblical teaching upon which we are saved. That it is in Christ, through faith, by grace, for the glory of God. Now we have to remind ourselves as we're reading the book of Romans that what we're reading is a letter. And it was a letter that was written to two important groups in the community, those that were Jewish and those that were Gentile. 
And like that community, we also reflect a lot of the same things. That like this community in Rome, we also live in an environment that was conditioned to believe that our favor or our right standing with God was often on the basis of what you did. Right Now, we've often lived in this environment. We've been raised in an environment, a culture that has impressed upon us this idea that you have to do something in order to earn something. This has been natural to our experiences in life growing up. Now, sadly, oftentimes the church can play into that idea of presenting or teaching this idea that you have to also continue to do things to get something out of this experience. In the Roman church, the makeup of this community was very similar to us today. For the Jewish people in this community, their salvation rested in the works of the law. That if you continue to be obedient and follow the patterns that were set before you by your forefathers, and you look at the law and you practice it rightly, you will receive a certain kind of favor. You will feel good about your status with God. For the Gentile members of their community, they were raised in an environment that put their confidence, their trust in their morality. That if they acted a certain way and they remained pretty good citizens in relationship to other people, and especially if they applied their wisdom, they were big on learning things, these were the tools that gave them confidence to believe they were right with God. However you divide it, both of these groups were united by an understanding that God's approval was often based on what you did or the quality of your efforts and your deeds. And the wisdom of Paul's argument here, and what he is doing is he is making an argument from the case of the greater to the lesser. His purpose in using Abraham, for example, is to make this point that if Abraham was justified by his faith in God, and it wasn't from his works, then how much more is that true for you and for me? If this has been his experience, it is certainly going to be your experience. If you take a look at verse 1. In verse 1, Paul acknowledges the prominence of Abraham as our forefather. Now, you might want to underline or kind of just circle those two words because it's an important part of Paul's argument, and it has a lot of relevance to what we're studying this morning. Paul starts out acknowledging Abraham is our forefather. And then in verse 3, he's going to quote specifically from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Again, a reference you might want to write down or put in the margin of your Bible. This reference is important because Abraham is using a portion from Abraham's story where God has just promised to him that he is going to be having a child with his wife Sarah. And that's relevant because as our forefather... In order for him to become the father of Israel, he's got to have children. And it's going to require, at the bare minimum, a child in order to start the process by which he's going to receive this promise God gave him where his descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. So he's our forefather. And then he quotes from Genesis 15, 6 in relationship to the fact that he is going to have a child. And as our forefather, Abraham demands the respect of being the father of of Israel. He is the original patriarch. He's the recipient of God's promises. He was the receiver of God's covenant. And as our forefather, Abraham was the start of something that originally did not exist. And it might seem like a subtle or minor point, but Paul is making it a point to stress that Abraham is only Abraham. As you know him as a patriarch, as you know him as our father, he is only Abraham because of God. Abraham didn't make himself Abraham. He didn't put himself in a position to be the one whose descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. You only know him as Abraham because of God. If you look at the end of verse 1 and into verse 2, here's how Paul explains this. In verse 1, he asks the question, what has Abraham found? What did Abraham find? It's as if Paul is suggesting, did Abraham make himself to be our forefather? Is this what he discovered? Is this the way he put himself to work to kind of generate this end result? That upon my decisions and my choices, I am going to become the forefather of the nation of Israel? Is this the outcome? Is this what he found? Verse 2. 
if Abraham was justified by works, meaning if it was about what he did, what he created, what he put his effort towards, well, of course he would have something to boast about. Look what I did. Maybe you can do it too. But Paul says something important. He says, but not before God. Not before God. He can't boast before God because Abraham has nothing to show for as our forefather apart from God. What part of Abraham's life can take any credit for who he became other than the fact that then apart from God, he was nothing but a pagan idolater? I love verse 3 here. Paul here, again, is inviting us to consider the grounds of our salvation, that we are justified by God. In the same way God made Abraham, Abraham, he is using his life as an example to prove the fact that we are who we are because of God. We are justified by God. And as Paul puts forward these incredible examples of both Abraham and, as we'll see in a moment, David, Look at what he is doing here and how he starts his, his argument to anchor his point. He says there in verse 3, For what does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? Now, friends, I don't mean to go too far off track here, but let me just take a quick moment to emphasize this simple but beautiful question. What I'm doing here right now is inserting that point in the sermon where we often call it an application Okay, so I'm going to do it now, not at the end of the sermon, because this is so relevant to all of us, especially for today. Let's keep in mind, Paul here is attempting to prove the doctrine of salvation. This is his purpose. This is the reason why he's writing this section of the text, to prove the doctrine of salvation. Paul is dealing with a major issue, a major issue. And friends, please understand, this is not a major issue in relationship to how we, you know, study the Bible. It's not a major issue only within the confines of this church. And for you and I who believe, Paul is dealing with a major issue that is relevant to every single person that lives and breathes and walks on the face of the earth. This doctrine of salvation is relevant to everyone because it is appointed to each person to die and after this comes the judgment. This major issue of the doctrine of salvation is relevant to everyone because all of us will be judged. The secret thoughts of men will be judged by Christ. The doctrine of salvation matters to every single person who lives. This is a major issue. It's a major issue for humanity. It's a major issue for our eternity. And so... Think about, I say all that because, again, Paul is dealing with a major, global, eternal issue. And what does he do? He says, look to the word of God. For so many of us today, we are facing similar attacks Against the fundamental principles of our faith, we are feeling the pressure of the culture pressing against us, wanting us to remove or rewrite what we believe about things like life, about sexuality and gender, even about the exclusivity of the gospel. Now, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, I mentioned four out of the five solas that became pillars to the Protestant Reformation. Here's the fifth. Sola Scriptura. Scripture alone. What does the Scripture say? Friends, hold fast to the Word of God. When pressed against the attacks of the culture or even from the pressures within the church, because they will come, we have to make sure that we are always asking the question, what does the scripture say? Never waver from God's word. The Bible is the authority by which we submit. It is the foundation upon which we stand. Everything, friends, everything from the cultural issues of life and sexuality and gender and critical race theory and social justice, everything 
but also everything, including what is said from this pulpit, must be judged by the word of God and not by convenience and not by comfort and certainly not by popular opinion. What does God's word say? It's a practice. It's a habit we should put into practice. Amen. As we look back to verse three, another main point of emphasis is that Paul quotes from Genesis 15, 6 to show that God's word has always been consistent concerning salvation. It has always been the justifying work of God on our behalf. It's like the song we just sang. He, he is the same God. He was justifying back then. He is justifying now. He is the same God. Can we add lyrics to songs? Is that like against the law? Okay, I don't know. And, and this is no small matter. This is no small matter. Paul is upholding, when he quotes Genesis 15, 6, he is upholding the unity of the scripture, showing their consistency as he is upholding and affirming the sufficiency of scripture. He's glad to use an Old Testament reference in order to support what is coming out as a New Testament teaching. And what might seem like a small minor detail is a powerful demonstration of God's consistent revelation that all of scripture is God breathed from Genesis to Revelation. And in that scripture, we see this theme, this unity of the grace of God working to reconcile a lost world back to himself. Now in verse three, the point that is stressed and why Paul uses this quote in particular is because of the phrase, Abraham believed God. He believed God. Apart from God, he was a, a heathen, a pagan idolater. Thousands of miles away from Israel. And God called him. And God set him out on a course. Take him to a land that wasn't his own to give him a future he could have never have imagined. And God gave Abraham this promise, and Abraham took God at his word and put his trust in him. It wasn't by any actions or deeds, but it was by belief. The just shall live by faith that Abraham, it says, was credited with righteousness. Now, this word credited is an accounting term that means to post to the account of, All right? You think about a banking ledger. I mean, who here doesn't like to have something posted to your account? I mean, I think we're all in good company when we'd say we don't mind a few extra bucks once in a while being put into our account. Right? Any college students, you know, sometimes they, they get to their bank statements like, oh, sweet, thanks, mom and dad. You put like 50 bucks in there for me. Like that can be life-giving, amen? I certainly remember those days to post to the account of. This word credited is found nine times in Romans chapter 4. And God, what Paul is saying is that God has taken the riches of his glory in Christ, Ephesians 1.8. He's taken the riches of his glory in Christ and he has transferred all of that righteousness into your account. Into your account. And make no mistake, your account is the one that is Romans 3.23 falling short of the glory of God. And if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, this idea of falling short means to not quite get there. You're, you're always lagging behind. You're trying, but you can't catch up. It's like making those monthly payments. And you see the statement balance, and you wonder, how on earth am I going to do that? So you, you pay for the, the minimum amount, like on a credit card statement. And you push that off just a little bit. But all of a sudden, that interest rate begins to get applied to the statement balance, and it just gets heavier and heavier, and month after month goes by, and you try to push it off by paying the bare minimum, and all of a sudden, you find yourself in an environment where you can't stand under the weight and the burden of the debt that is over your life. And God has taken the riches of his glory in Christ and he has transferred all of that righteousness into your account. A verse that helps us think about this is 2 Corinthians 5.21, that God, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become, we might become flush with the righteousness of God in him. This is the glory of God's divine bookkeeping, friends. 
God takes what's dead and he brings it to life. He takes what's old and he makes it new. He takes what is orphaned and he makes it an heir. He takes what was captive and he sets it free. I love how pastor and author Stephen Lawson puts it, the worst about you was credited to Christ and the best about Christ was credited to you. Thanks be to God. Now, like a little interlude between testimonies of Abraham and David, Paul writes verses four and five to succinctly describe the majesty of the gospel. Let me just read these two for us quickly. Paul then says, now to the one who works, now let me just make sure we're understanding this isn't about employment and, and our daily labor we think about Monday through Friday. He's specifically speaking about works righteousness, thinking we can do something to earn favor in the eyes of God. Now to the one who works, thinking it's about them, that they can somehow create an environment where God receives them, his wage is not credited as a favor. It's, it's not a gift. If that's your mentality, it's what is due. This work, you are paid at your job because that's what is due. And what Paul's saying here in relationship to the gospel is if you want to believe that you somehow save yourself, you're going to get what you deserve. And be careful about that because what you deserve is the wrath of God. That there's nothing you can do to earn that salvation. So you will get what is due, but it's going to be the judgment and the condemnation of God for thinking in arrogance that you can somehow do something to stand in an equal place with his holiness. But, verse 5, to the one who does not work. Again, he's not talking slothful and, and lazy couch potato. But the one who does not believe that they can save themselves, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, like a pagan idolater named Abraham, his faith is credited as righteousness. And so the majesty of the gospel is that it is a gift of God's grace to undeserving sinners. Our salvation is not based on a works-based reward system, but by the governing principle of faith, Romans 3.27. You remember that from the other week? The law of faith is the system, the means by which God chooses to give salvation to us. So like our forefather Abraham, our account is overwhelmed with honor and glory when we place our trust in the rich provisions of God through Christ. Second point, verses 6 through 8, David received. So Abraham believes David received. And what we find in verse 6 is Paul continuing this argument from the greater to the lesser. If it's true of them, it's certainly true of you. So just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. See, Paul's effectively used the father of Israel. He's now using the great king of Israel to establish this comprehensive truth that our salvation is in the gift of God's grace in Christ through faith. Verses 7 and 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. What, what makes Paul's argument so effective here is that he is showing the desperation of our need, which further underscores the basic idea that we can never save ourselves no matter how hard we try. And why? It's because our sin condemns us. We think we can somehow work for or earn our righteousness, this good standing with God, but sometimes we miss the obvious point. The point isn't that we can somehow earn our salvation. The point is that it's not righteousness we're earning, it's forgiveness that we have to receive. This is why the Bible tells us, like in Isaiah 64, verse 6, that all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy rag in the eyes of God. It's because our works of righteousness mean nothing when done in the sin that covers us. A helpful analogy, I think, is when I try to uh, engage in a, a, a work of value. And I try to do a good deed for my wife and for my family. So I start to clean the floors. 
Isn't this a good deed that I'm doing? My wife's going to be so pleased that she's going to have clean floors to walk on. What does it matter if I'm cleaning the floors while wearing muddy shoes? What good is it if I'm doing the laundry while having barbecue all over my fingers from the dinner that I ate? All of our works are like a filthy rag in the eyes of a holy God. And David was perhaps more aware of this very reality than many of us. He had sinned against God when he slept with, an unmarried, with a married woman. He then attempted to cover that up. Right? He tried to, this is the problem when we try to cover up our own mistakes. What does he do? He then puts that woman's husband, Uriah, onto the front lines of battle, knowing that he will be killed. David knows the blessing of forgiveness, verse 7, because he knows the gravity of his offense. And as much as he also sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah and Israel, he ultimately sinned against God. And this is as much what he writes in his confession in Psalm 51, verse 4, against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak, you're blameless when you judge. Paul's purpose here in quoting David is to simply illustrate, friends, that our salvation can never be achieved. It can only be received. And this is why David's own words acknowledge this blessing of receiving forgiveness. To be blessed means to be under the favor of God, to have his acceptance. And despite the many foolish and rebellious choices David made in his life, he recognized the justifying work of God through faith. He gave clear acceptance and praise to God for doing for him something he could have never have done on his own. You see, it was God who forgave. It was God who covered, and it was God who did not take into account. And friends, these words of description are all applied to Jesus. Right? It's because of Jesus that God forgives. It's because of Jesus that God sends away our sins. That as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. It's because of Jesus that our sins are covered by the blood of the Lamb. And it's because of Jesus that our sin was transferred to him in exchange for his righteousness. You see, the gospel is the very power of God for salvation to those who believe and the just shall live by faith. And so the good news of the gospel is that we can enjoy fellowship with God through the forgiveness of our sins when we place our trust in the work that saves, which is the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And friends, here's the thing. I, I leave you with this. The power and the beauty of this gift is that it belongs to everyone. It belongs to any one of us. Abraham was a heathen idolater. David was a, a small, young shepherd boy in a long line of brothers who then adds to his resume adulterer and murderer. Paul, this whole time, has been making an argument from the greater to the lesser. Well, consider it here in this way, from the greater to the lesser. If a pagan idolater and an adulterer and murderer can receive the righteousness of God through faith. How much more then is that true for you? See, no matter how far away you may feel from God, no matter how unworthy you feel you are, God has proven his love for you. He's, he's paid the full debt of your sin. And so put your hope and your trust in Jesus. He gave his life to ransom you. He gave his life to cover you with his blood. And he gave his life to put into your account the riches of his glorious grace. So look to Jesus and be saved. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we give you the thanks and all the praise today for our work that you have accomplished on our behalf, God. You have... You have found us. You have ransomed us. You have paid a penalty on our behalf. You have secured us through the life of your son, Jesus. All that we are, all that we have, 
It's like these crowns that we lay before your throne. You are deserving of it all. So we thank you for the precious gift of grace, for this marvelous truth that as long as we believe that you are God, we will be saved, that you have this power to cleanse us from our sin. So Jesus, I just pray that there'd be someone here today, Lord, who just maybe is receiving for the first time in their heart this transformative truth that, that their value, their worth, is not based on what they do, but it's based on who they believe and what he has done for us. We thank you, Jesus. We love you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Friends, let me invite you to stand for this final word of encouragement from Titus 3, beginning in verse 5. God has saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom God poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified, counted as worthy and accepted by God according to his grace, we would be made heirs based on the hope that is given to us eternal life. This is our confidence, friends. It rests entirely in Jesus. So may you live with a spirit of joy and gratitude, knowing what belongs to you, not because you earned it, but because he did it. Amen? He did it. It is finished. God bless you. You're dismissed.